Well, welcome back, folks. We are uh, following the history of the music of the 1950s and 60s. I like to say it's the soundtrack of our youth. And uh, we have been talking about the year 1960. We're going to do a little bit more today, and then we're going to finish up next week on 1960. So let's let old Bob Seeger bring us in like the other day. Okay, review. Let's talk about what we talked about last week. We saw how Eddie Cochran died in a tragic automobile accident, and then in a case kind of art uh, imitating life, there seemed to be just a whole series of teen tragedy songs, which were all kind of gruesome, uh, became very popular. Probably the most popular was Mark Denning's number one hit, Teen Angel. And then we saw with the rest of the period, the last hour that last week, we spent on talking about the women. Because up to this point, there hadn't been a lot of women in what we call rock and roll in the, in the pop era, the 50s and 60s. All of a sudden, they really began emerging in 1960. The first one, and maybe the most popular, was Brenda Lee. Brenda Lee started out as a preteen country phenomena. We saw her singing Jambalaya at the age of 11, and then she emerged into one of the biggest selling pop artists of the 60s with her record, I'm Sorry, becoming her signature song. And then we saw how Connie Francis uh, followed up her really big hit in the late 50s uh, by singing Everybody's Somebody's Fool, which was the first number one hit on the Billboard pop chart for a female artist. Can you believe that? The first number one hit on the Billboard pop chart for a female artist solidified her place as the first lady of rock and roll. We then listened to Anita Bryant sing Paper Roses, which was later on covered by a very young Marie Osmond in the 70s. It also charted number one on the pop chart. And after her singing career kind of uh, Wayne Dowd, um, she became a spokesperson for several large corporations, and then she suffered probably the first case of what we now call cancel culture um, because of her strong religious convictions. Uh, we saw how the Shirelles, uh, a group of high school teen girls from New Jersey, laid the foundation for the many successful girl groups. They kind of started the whole girl group genre which would be followed up with, you know, the Supreme, the Martha and the Vandellas, the Marvelettes, on and on and on. Did you see, you know, um, Gladys Knight and the Pips? We just saw tons of them in the 60s. Shrells were kind of the first. They had a really big hit song with Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow. And finally, we kind of ended it with a bang. Uh, all these other girls had been kind of mellow and kind of uh, soft and, and love ballads. Tina Turner was anything but that. We saw how Tina Turner kind of erupted on the scene, and that would be a good way to phrase it. Uh, her first hit song was uh, A Fool in Love, which we saw her sing later in the 80s, and uh, that began a 60-year-long career for the queen of rock and roll. I mean, she was just a gigantic artist for 60 years. So, Let's look at today's trivia question. In 1960, a group of studio musicians recorded a novelty song about the annex of a caveman that went to number one on the Billboard chart and became one of the biggest songs of the year. What was the name of the song? And I'll bet some of you remember this. And... Okay, well, I hit the wrong key and put the music up after the 
the slide came up. Alley Oop was composed by Dallas Frazier and was inspired by the V.T. Hamlin uh, created comic strip of the same name. I used to read Alley Oop every day. The song was then recorded by a group of studio musicians who called themselves the Hollywood Argyles. They they really weren't uh, singers or any. They were just musicians. The lead singer producer was a guy by the name of Gary Paxton, who if you want to read about a strange man, read about Gary Paxton. He was kind of a weird dude. Uh, he also produced Monster Mash, another novelty song in 1962. Somehow this song went all the way to number one, uh, making it one of the most improbable novelty songs of all time. So let's watch the Hollywood Argyles, or at least listen to them sing Alley Oop. <laughs> There's a man in the funny papers we all know He lives way back a long time ago He don't eat nothing but a bear cat stew Well, this cat's name is a Ali Oo he got a chauffeur that's a genuine dinosaur And he can knuckle your head before you count to fall He got a big ugly club and a head full of how Like great big lions and grizzly bears The toughest man that is alive Wearing clothes from a wildcat's hide He's the king of the jungle jive Look at that caveman go He rides through the jungle Tearing limbs off of trees Knocking great big monsters Dead on their knees the cats don't bug him cause they know better Cause he's a mean motor scooter and a bad go-getter He's the toughest man there is alive Wears clothes from a wild cat's hide He's the king of the jungle jive Look at that king man go Look at that caveman go He sure is hip, ain't he? Like what's happening? He's too much Right, daddy, right Hi, yo, dinosaur Right, daddy, right Get him, man Okay, boy that ought to be the way to get us going today, talking about Alley Oop. Uh, well, the rest of the time today, we're going to be talking about soul and R&B music because 1960 was the year that soul and R&B really began to break out. And it all started, in a way, because of Chubby Chicker and the Twist. Uh, if I could see all of you, I could ask for a show of hands. I mean, you did the twist and you were a young person. I'll bet a lot of you did. Ernest Evans was born in South Carolina, but was raised in South Philly, PA. And uh, as a teenager, he found out that he had a voice for impressions. He could do things like Elvis and all these people. And he began to imitate all these and, and kind of entertain his friends. By the way, one of them was Fabian. Uh, went to school with him. He also worked weekends at an Italian market, and one of his customers was Dick Clark. And so when Dick Clark would come in, Ernest would go into his little jive about uh, imitating famous artists like Elvis and Jerry Lee and Fats Domino and all. Clark thought it was kind of neat, and he invited him to record a novelty song someone had given him about a singer uh, 
uh, about a teacher that had an unruly class of musical performers. And in the class, everyone would sing it in a different voice, like Elvis and Fast Dominoes, Taylor made for Ernest. Uh, Dick Clark liked it. He thought it was really good. Never went anywhere. I can remember when it was played on the radio, probably after the twist came on. But uh, it never really became a big hit. But Clark was interested enough in Evans that he uh, persuaded the uh, record company that he helped was involved with to record a song that had been released a year before by a man by the name of Hank Ballard, who was kind of a pop star in his own right. Uh, but it never really gone anywhere. It was called The Twist. The record producers finally decided they were going to let him perform, but they said, we got to change your name. Ernest Evans won't work. And since he was a little bit on the chubby side, not fat, but he was a little, little bit on chubby side, they said, let's change your name to Chubby Checker. And Clark began letting him perform on American Bandstand, which was the way Clark did things. And sure enough, it caught on. And folks, I don't think there's ever been a dance craze has swept America quite like the twist. I mean, literally everybody that was dancing in the 1960s early was dancing to twist. I, I mean, everybody. Ironically, Checker came to hate the song. He said it kind of wiped out his singing career because everybody thought he could only sing to twist. And uh, in another twist of irony, teenagers uh, got to the point where they didn't like it much anymore not because they didn't like the song and not because they didn't like the dance. It's because their parents took it up. Well, you know, no teenager is going to want to dance the same song their parents are dancing to. I mean, you know, they're not going to do that. So here you had the Kennedys dancing in the White House. You had Marilyn Monroe dancing to the twist of the Peppermint Lounge. And the uh, young people said that we don't want anything to do with that. You know, if our parents are going to be dancing to it, we'll find something else. Uh, Checker's career kind of never went very much further than that. And uh, even though he made a significant, uh, you know, uh, career, you know, out of this, and even though he had some um, some real importance in the rock and roll thing, he's never been invo invo uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So here is Chubby Checker dancing to the twist. And if any of are able, get up and dance with him. <laughs>
Okay, so there is the twist. Um, well, rhythm and blues and soul, as I said, <clears throat> absolutely took off in 1960. Uh, the king of soul, in a lot of ways, was Sam Cooke. Uh, we've already seen how Sam Cooke kind of left gospel music in the late 50s after he had a terrifically big hit called You Send Me. And I mean, the guy just absolutely was amazing to sing. And people loved him. The women particularly loved him. Um, and he began releasing a string of hits that brought him to the height of his career in the early 60s. In 1960 alone, he released five singles, two of which hit number one and collectively sold millions, making him one of the most popular musical artists in the U.S. at that time. Uh, the first one that uh, hit number one was a, a song called The Chain Gang, which was written by Cook, and uh, he said it was inspired because uh, he happened to be driving alongside the road down in the south on the Chitlin Circuit and saw a bunch of uh, prisoners on a chain gang chain gang alongside the road working he thought i'm going to write a song about that and he wrote it the next one uh even was bigger uh it was wonderful world by lou adler and herb adler uh two of the big songwriters of the era uh it not only hit number one on the rb chart it hit number one on the pop chart ended up being the fifth best-selling single of the year and uh I've always thought it was one of the greatest songs of the era. So let's listen to Wonderful World by Sam Cooke. Don't know much about history. Don't know much biology. Don't know much about a science book. Don't know much about the French I took. But I do know that I love you. Okay, so there's Sam Cooke. We're going to hear some more songs by Sam Cooke over the next few weeks. Uh, he unfortunately met an early demise, uh, kind of a tragic end to his life, as we'll see. Uh, but not before he left a, a real series of records that still, you know, are huge in the musical world today. Well, last week, or not last week, but a couple of weeks ago, we saw how the Drifters had formed and the drifters became really along with the platters the premier vocal group of the early 1960s uh they had a massive hit in 1959 there goes my baby it was soon followed up in 1960 with two really huge hits the first one was this magic moment i know wallings have heard this song and i'd love to play it but i don't have time to play everything uh, written by Dom Palmas, Mort Schumann, produced in the studio by Jerry Lieber, Mike Stoller, uh, the guys that uh, had done Hound Dog and all these songs for Elvis. 
Uh, it would be one of the first songs of the era to com use a complete orchestra as a backing unit. Uh, and it's still played every year uh, on the on the radio. We reached number 16 on the Billboard Pop Chart, number four on the R&B charts, along with uh, you know the man sitting lead vocal man by the name of Benny King, who would later on have a just a huge uh, solo career. Uh, the next song is uh, the biggest hit that uh, they had, really. It was just a gigantic hit called Save the Last Dance for Me. It was kind of their signature song. Uh, there's a great story behind this song. Don Pomus also wrote it. Uh, here's the story. Pomus was a cripple. He was in a wheelchair. He had childhood polio. And uh, he had married a young woman. Uh, and she loved to dance because she was a Broadway dancer. Of course, he couldn't dance, but he said every weekend he she he would take her out to dance, and he would sit in his wheelchair at the table, and you know she always danced with other men all the time, and he had no problem with it. But at the end of the night, when the DJ or the band would announce that it was their last song, she would come over. And she would dance with him as he sat at the table in his wheelchair. And he said, you know, that would make a great song. End up writing the song. And it did make a great song. Uh, the fourth best-selling record of 1960. And and I just love this song. It's still one of the greatest songs of the era, in my opinion. So let's listen to the Drifters sing Save the Last Dance for Me. Benny King, lead vocal. You can dance, every dance with the guy who gives you the eye and let him hold you tight. You can smile, every smile for the man who held your hand neath the pale moonlight. But don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're gonna be. So darling, say the last dance for me. Oh, I know, oh, I know that the music's yes, fine like sparkling oh, wine. Go and have your yes, fun. I know. Oh, I know. Laugh and sing. Yes, I know. But while we're oh, apart, don't give your yes, heart to anyone. Oh, but yes, don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're gonna be. So die, say the last dance for me. Baby, don't you know I love you so? Can't you feel it when we touch? I will never, never let you go. I love you oh so much. You can dance, you can dance. Go and carry you on dance. till the night is gone dance. and it's time to you go. Can dance. You can dance. If he asks, you can dance. if you're all you alone, can, can he take you, you home? Dance. You must tell him you no. Cause don't forget who's taking you home And in whose arms you're gonna be So darling, say the last dance for me Cause don't forget who's taking you home And in whose arms you're gonna be So darling, say the last dance for me mm, Say the last dance for me Okay, great song and uh, great story behind this song. Uh, the next guy we're going to talk about is Jerry Butler. Um, a lot of people have forgotten about Jerry Butler. Uh, Jerry Butler was born in Sunflower, Mississippi, but grew up in the mean streets of Chicago, the Cabrini Green Projects, raised in a church along with a guy by the name of Curtis Mayfield, uh, who became a, a huge uh, singer in the 1960s as well. 
Their soulful gospel renderings caught the attention of record producers, and soon they had formed kind of an almost like a super group of R&B singers known as the Impressions. Uh, by the way, if you uh, listen to uh, Pastor Dwayne talk about the gospel music of the 50s and 60s that he did kind of simultaneously with me, you know the Impressions were a really important uh, part of that early gospel transition uh, of that era. Well, he soon left the group to pursue a cult solo career. Uh, kind of became known as the Iceman because he was such a cool way of singing. Uh, had a massive hit in 1960, He Will Break Your Heart, which we're going to listen to in a minute. Reached number one on the R&B chart, number seven on the pop chart. Uh, and besides that, he was, uh, besides being a great singer, he's also a great songwriter. Um, wrote one of the uh, really big songs for Otis Redding called I've Been Loving You Too Long, which was kind of Otis's first big hit in 1965. We'll hear that down the line. While he had a few more modern hits, his career kind of peaked in the late 1960s, and Butler turned to politics and became uh, a uh, on the Board of Commissioners at the Cook County uh, Board of uh, Commissioners. Served from 1985 to 2018. Uh, finally, he was forced to retire. Still lives in Chicago. Uh, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991. But this is his really big hit called He Will Break Your Heart. Pretty good song. He don't love you like I love you. If he did, he wouldn't break your heart. He don't love you like I I could say, whoa, but he's had so many rehearsals, girl, to him it's just another play, but wait, and when the final act is over, and you're left standing all alone. When he takes his bow and makes his exit, uh -huh, I'll be there to take you home. He don't love you, and he never will like I love you, because if he did, he wouldn't uh, break. Right, great song, Jerry Butler. Well, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Boy, what a long career Smokey Robinson and the Miracles had. Uh, it, probably no other musical artist act has so associated with the Motown, except maybe the Supremes, as is William Smokey Robinson. I mean, the guy was just massive 
in the 60s and 70s still going. Most of uh, mostly he was a black ancestry, but he also said he had French, Nigerian, Scandinavian, Portuguese, and Cherokee ancestry, which kind of accounts for his light skin. And he also has kind of golden green eyes. Very, very handsome man. I uh, was born and raised in Detroit, only a few houses down from Aretha Franklin. In fact, he and Aretha were good friends uh, throughout their careers. Uh, 1957, he formed a singing group called The Miracles. And they would not only be, uh, he would not only be the lead singer, but the main songwriter and producer for the group for the next 15 years. Then he went solo for a while, came back with The Miracles for a while, and then went out and just basically became a producer and a songwriter. Uh, folks, he laid the groundwork for the Motown sound and the men's groups of Motown in the 60s, the Four Tops, the Temptations, you name it. All those groups that came after Smokey Robinson and the Miracles started uh, all owed what they owed to, to Smokey. Uh, we saw how his first hit back in 1959, Shop Around, was Motown's first million-selling single, but it sure wasn't the last one. Over the next decade, they would have 26 top 40 hits, several top 10 hits, and including their one of their biggest, which was 1960, you really got a hold on me. Uh, 1969, Robinson finally retired from touring uh, for a while. Barry Gordy, uh, the owner of Motown, realized how important this guy was, made him vice president. A few years later, he resumed his career and recorded several hits alone and kind of resurrect the miracles for a while. Um, just has had a massive hit. Uh, you name the award, and Smokey Robertson has won it. I mean, he has won just about every conceivable music award that you can win. Uh, one of the very first people inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as an individual later on as a member of the Miracles. So we're going to listen to Smokey Robertson and the Miracles sing, You've Really Got a Hold of Me. Now, when we watch this video of him, I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. Number one, uh, Barry Gordy was really big on making sure that his groups were really dressed nice and acted nice. He wanted to stay away from politics. He said, we're making music for young America. And he was all about making the money. So he hired a choreographer. And, you know, you will see this. Uh, these other groups have been just kind of out there. They would have natural rhythm and all. But the Miracles were the first group to really be a choreographed group. On top of that, he hired a hairdresser, a makeup artist, uh, 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 you know, someone to help them learn how to dress. Uh, this will go on with like the Supremes um, and all these other groups. He absolutely insisted that his groups be immaculate. And if you look at Smokey Robinson Miracles here in this in this uh, video we're going to show you here, you'll notice they got French cuffs. They're all dressed exactly alike. Uh, very classy looking groups. That was the way he expected his people to look. He said, I want you to really shine when you get out there. And they did, folks. They were really uh, just amazing. When the Supremes came around a few years later, he dressed them up in gowns and high heels and and uh, nice hairdo, makeup. And they were also choreographed. It was It was his trademark in Motown, besides having some of the greatest songs that's ever been written in the era. I mean, he, he had it all. So let's listen to Smokey Robertson uh, sing uh, his one of his biggest hits, which was You Really Got a Hold of Me, along with the Miracles. And just watch the group. It's really impressive the way they dance.
Okay, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, one of the great groups uh, started in the 60s. Well, one last group today, Maurice Williams and the Zodiacs. Now, you're probably sitting there scratching your head like, who in the world is Maurice Williams and the Zodiacs? Well, you'll recognize their song here in a minute. Sometimes they're often included in that one hit wonder category because of their massive hit stay that they recorded in 1960. But that's kind of unfair to them because they really had a long and groundbreaking career starting in the mid-50s. Uh, and Maurice Williams did as the lead singer for a group called the Gladiolas. Uh, you maybe remember the Gladiolas were the first group that recorded Little Darling. But because it didn't, you know, the segregation of those things, it didn't go over very big in most of the urban centers. It was only when the white group, the Diamonds, recorded it that all of a sudden it took off and became one of the biggest songs of the 1950s. Um, between 1957 and 60, the Gladiolas changed their name. They became the Zodiacs. They thought it was maybe a little bit more up to date. They toured around on the Chitlin Circus uh, in relative obscurity until they recorded Stay in 1960. And it just shot up the charts. Hit number one, sold over 8 million records. Uh, became one of those records that people just love to cover. Uh, the Four Seasons later on covered it, with, had a big hit with it. Jackson Brown had a big hit with it. And then, if that wasn't enough, in the 1980s, a movie called, came out called Dirty Dancing, and it was included on that movie. And, I mean, that just, I mean, people loved that movie, and they loved the music, started a whole revival of the doo-wop craze in the uh, 80s and 90s for a while. People started going back and listening to the doo-wop music. Um, on top of that, it's remembered as being the shortest song to hit number one on the Billboard chart. only lasted about a minute and a half. Uh, today, the Gladiola Zodiacs are considered one of the pioneer groups uh, which helped make doo-wop music popular. And uh, their harmony structure kind of was the norm for every group, doo-wop group that followed them. Unfortunately, despite their obvious influence on rock and roll, they've been snubbed by the Hall of Fame, which you'll get to see is kind of a thing, but it's been uh, they've been inducted into the Vocal Hall of Fame. And by the way, Williams is still alive. He still lives in South Carolina, and he's still involved in the uh, music scene today, as I understand. So let's listen. One last song, very short song, Morris, Maurice Williams and Stay.
Okay, so that's it for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, our session of walking down memory lane and listening to the hits of 1960. Next week, it's going to be all about the Nashville sound. We're going to look how Nash the Nashville sound just revolutionized country music in the 1960 era. And uh, I've got a unique thing I'm going to be doing. So uh, if you like country music, uh, make sure to tune in next week because you're going to see how the Nashville sound has just continued clear up until modern times. So that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and we will see you next week.